I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's premier home purchase lender. We've created a new way to protect you from unpredictable interest rates. Our exclusive Rate Shield approval. First, we lock your interest rate for up to 90 days. Then, if rates go up, your rate stays locked. But if rates go down, your rate drops. Either way, you win. Call us today at 800 Quicken or go to rocketmortgage.com. Rate Shield approval only valid on certain 30 year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply. Welcome to On Trial, starring Mark Radlich, also starring Sean Comer. Hope you're ready, Hollywood, because you're On Trial. All rise. Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Ito presiding. This is On Trial, and I'm your host, the Mandated Reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radledge. Tonight, I'm in the role of prosecutor, and on the docket is Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, the accuser is a gal I work with. What a cutie. Her name is Kristen Johnson, and she said, I want you to see this film and I said, why don't you go back to work, for Christ's sakes? We've got inmates to process. And she says, no, 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 I'd rather talk to you about film. And I said, okay. She said, I want you to watch this. This was months ago. She was like, you got to see this movie, Pan's Labyrinth. It's the bee's knees. And I said, okay. Uh, well, I'm not watching anything unless I can somehow convert it into some sort of content for my podcast. Because that's the kind of guy I am. And uh, so here we are. I found a space for it on the docket here. For the uh, On Trial podcast, and here to defend a 2006 Cannes Film uh, Festival release, uh, winner of many numerous awards, Academy Awards, BAFTA <laughs> Awards, Saturn Awards. This man's got the easy job tonight. He's your defense attorney. He's Sean Comer, and you're not. Hello, Sean. How are you? Greetings, everyone. I'm Sean. You're not. You're Johnny Cochran for the evening to our apparent uh, Honorable Judge Ito. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, in my case, from the brand new Fortress of Seanitude, I'm living back in Kansas City again for the first time in... da 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 carry the da 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 uh, Oh, fuck me sideways. Eight years. <laughs> um... Good to be home. I've been settling into my new digs, but it's nice to have a podcast on the docket again. And what a show we've got tonight. Mark, uh, my condolences. You really did bite the bullet on the hard one this evening. <laughs> this is one of those where, uh, if this were real life, the client came in, put down the money, and said, I'm going to need you to, uh, to prosecute this case. And I took the case before looking at what it was. Like, oh, Christ, you, <laughs> you <laughs> murdered a school bus full of children, all right? Um... <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. How, how, how many prosecutors do you know who accept cases based on people walking in and just plunking down <laughs> big baskets? How does Florida law work? Not well, I'll That's tell you that much. Is, is there something about the Florida judicial system I'm not aware of? Um. <laughs> Aside from plenty. Uh, no, it uh, the the Florida judicial system is um, is a mystery wrapped in a nutshell and wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in uh, the funny pages. <laughs> I can see why you love it so. Indeed. All right, I hear you've got notes. Notes about Pan's Labyrinth. Hit it, Johnny. I got just a few. So, as a child, uh, director extraordinaire Guillermo del Toro. Uh, was beset by a recurring set, a recurring um, series of lucid dreams. In these, as he once told Charlie Rose, he would wake up every midnight on cue, and this uh, fawn would step out from behind a grandfather clock. It was originally a 
your sort of traditional half goat, half man being uh, beautiful, downright majestic. But as they progressed, it sort of evolved into this goat faced being uh, composed of a tangle of moss, vines, earth, tree bark, and he became mysterious, enigmatic, and completely devoid of, or not completely, but mostly devoid of trustworthiness. Uh, many, many moons later, uh, Del Toro would, as an adult, would travel around with these notebooks packed with ideas, drawings, doodles, plot concepts, what have you, about about 20 years worth of the writings. And, and then at one point during a production, he happened to misplace one of them in a London taxi, which was later returned to him. Uh, from that notebook, uh, he presented a story to a writer friend originally about a pregnant woman who falls in love with a fawn. And about a year and a half before filming, Del Toro relayed this experience, this experience to uh, writer Sergi Lopez... And Lopez would say that for two and a half hours, he explained to me all the movie, but with all the details, it was incredible. And when he finished, I said, you have a, I said, you have a script? He said, no, nothing is written. This was all just right off the top of his head, just right off his knot. And what we ultimately got was this fantastical fable of war and mythicism set during the summer of 1944, five years after the Spanish so, Spanish Civil War, um, during the early Francoist period in Spain, uh, during the conflict between the, fa- the fascists and the communists. It's a story that Del Toro has said it, it has its religious influences. He calls it, Del Toro himself calls it, quote, a truly profane film, a layman's riff on Catholic dogma. Um, and, you know, most notably uh, the famous scene with the pale man, the one with, with eyes on his, with eyes on his hands was intended as a, a particular riff on the church, particularly because of the pale man preferring children over this opulent feast that's set out right in front of him. And what resulted was also something of a an informal sequel to Del Toro's earlier film, The Devil's Backbone, including cameo appear- appearances by by two of that film, by that film's two protagonists, uh, Fernando Tielve and Inigo Garces, as unarmed uh, guerrilla soldiers in Pan's Labyrinth. But you know, it takes it takes its influences from. I mean, the most obvious one, pretty much right from the start. You can tell right from about the first fifteen minutes of the movie, uh, the writings of Lewis Carroll, the Alice books. Uh, Jorge Luis Borges's uh, Ficciones, Arthur Mockins, The Great God Pan, and the White People, Lord Dunsany's The Blessing of Pan, um, Algernon Blackwood's Pan's Garden, and the works of Francisco Goya. Uh, so, very strongly influenced. Um, it's a feast for it's a feast for the eyes, just uh, gripping. As a whole, although it kind of takes a, a little bit for its to some often seemingly unconnected plot threads to coalesce, and when it released in 2006, it was not what you would call a spectacular box office success. On a budget of 19 million dollars, it did 83.3 million. So you could say it's possibly 
one of the least successful movies we put under the microscope, at least commercially. It was an absolute critical darling, though. Uh, in particular, it won three out of the five Academy Awards for, for which it was nominated, Best Cinematography, Best Production Design, and Best Makeup. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, that's three out of the six, because it was also nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Original Score. As Mark referenced, it won three BAFTA Awards for Best Makeup and Hair, Best Costume Design, and Best Film Not in the English Language. Uh, Del Toro was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the Golden Globe Awards. Um, arguably, its its greatest success might as, might have very well been at the Goya Awards, where it was nominated for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 awards, and won five for Best New Actress, Ivana Vaquero, um, Best um, best Makeup and Hairstyles, Best Editing, and Best Sound, and Best Special Effects. So, what we have here is something that people who have seen it absolutely adore. Critics were absolutely fanatical about it. It's just that, well, by all indications, not that many people saw it. So, Mark, are we good to go onward and? Oh yeah, on no, I, w- I was waiting for you to conclude. <laughs> if you're done, yeah, we'll. Uh... Um, yeah, if you, if you're done with your notes, then all right, let's do a quick, <clears throat> let's do a quick plot synopsis, and then let's jump right into this. <clears throat> this is not going to be one of our lengthy episodes. I'll just warn people ahead of time. Now that I've said that, we'll be on here for about 10 hours. But um, basically, the, the plot of this thing is uh, it takes place in 1944. Franco is Spain. Our protagonist is Ophelia. She's a young girl coming to live with uh, Captain Vidal, who is her new stepfather. He's traveling with her pregnant mother, who is sick. Um, over the course of being there, she comes across a fairy. The fairy leads her to an ancient stone uh, labyrinth. The, sh- the film shifts between uh, a couple of trips into this labyrinth that, that she makes and the rest of it being t- uh, taking place on this base, this uh, castle where, where uh, the captain and his army is at. There's rebels that they're hunting down. Um, have to, without just reading straight from the Wikipedia, you'll have to excuse me. The, the basic details are... Uh, she goes into the labyrinth once. Uh, she gets this route to help her mom um, deal with the pregnancy. It actually starts to help. Uh, however, it's found out, and uh, the captain takes the route and throws it in the fire. Um, the mom ends up getting sick. She ends up giving birth to the uh, the baby uh, boy, but dies in childbirth. Meanwhile, there's a second... Uh, trip into the labyrinth where she is told, you know, don't eat anything at the pale man's table. She, of course, eats two grapes. The pale man then gets up, eats a couple of the fairies, like, bites their heads off, and uh, chases her out of there, and she's told by Fawn uh, she cannot go back. Uh, Later on, uh, as their captain is dealing with uh, more of the rebel issue and we have a mole in the works a woman who works in the kitchen Mercedes, she's actually a traitor uh, as we're dealing with that uh, the fawn says to Ophelia, hey we're going to give you one more shot here but you got to steal your your brother and uh, bring him to the labyrinth and if uh, you allow us to take just a drop of blood, you'll be able to re- you'll be able to return to uh, the underworld where you are in fact a princess. Uh, she doesn't want to do it. She ends up getting shot by her father, her stepfather, and she dies. Uh, but because of the noble sacrifice, she is uh, able to reclaim her throne as princess of the underworld. 
Uh, meanwhile, Mercedes and the Rebels end up uh, cornering the captain and uh, I believe they shoot him in the end, as I recall. Um, yeah, shoots and kills him. And uh, takes the sun. And that's pretty much the movie. There's a lot more detail to it than that, but those are the basic points. Look, let, let, let's get right to this, okay? Pan's Labyrinth. Or, what if somebody thought Alice in Wonderland just wasn't depressing enough and wanted to have a go at making a movie that's, you know, gr- that's as gross and depressing as po- humanly possible, Okay? I've been watching the uh, Nerd Crew internet shorts uh, from Red Letter Media, specifically the ones that were dealing with Rogue One, and there's a comment they made about it that reminds me of this movie. They were like, you know, Rogue One, which they also described as Star Wars fan fiction, (laughs) the the, the highest quality Star Wars fan fiction they'd ever seen. But they made a the more more related to this movie. They made a specific comment of, you know, what if somebody took a children's fantasy and made it a gritty war movie so that as an adult they could justify you know liking and appreciating it because they can't justify liking and appreciating a child's fairy tale. And that's what I was thinking about while I was watching this. I was also thinking, who the hell is this for? Um. You know, I, as I read about it and, and researched it, the, the term fairy tale keeps coming up. And yeah, you know, some of our most famous fairy tales are pretty grim. Grimm's fairy tales, get it? Um, pretty, pretty violent stuff. You know, certainly the, the actual story of Cinderella um, and what happens to her, not the Disney version. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty violent stuff. Snow White, same thing. But. Most people associate fairy tales with, you know, brighter and happier than uh, than what this movie gives us. This feels like, and, and, and credit to Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro, you have a vision, you're able to, you're blessed enough to carry out that vision and make a film, and the film makes money. I, I don't take away his success. In, in any of my criticism, I, I'm not going to say that this is a bad movie or that he doesn't deserve the credit that he gets for it, because he does. I... I can appreciate it on that level. However, don't tell me this is a... uh, Don't tell me this is a fairy tale meant for children and then show me what this movie is. Which, 90% of it, first of all, doesn't take place in the labyrinth, okay? Like, when when, when I was pitched this movie to to review it uh, on this show, to watch it and review it, Challenged, really, uh, and, I, and and the movie is called Pan's Labyrinth. I assume most of it's going to take place in the labyrinth. I assume, I mean, maybe this is my fault. I'm going to be taken to a place in the far away, wonderful journey. You know, I expected David Bowie in his huge penis and tight pants to be greeting me at the door and taking me to a far away place. That's what I was expecting. Dance, <laughs> magic dance. That's what I wanted to see. The actual labyrinth. And instead, I got 90% a war picture where we see people being shot in the head. We see the captain's face being uh, cut like the Joker. Uh, we almost, uh, Mercedes almost gets executed herself, you know, until she gets all stabby. I mean, I've been known to show my kids things they probably shouldn't see. Again, uh, you can check out previous podcasts where I talked about uh, sitting down and watching the Orville with my kids. To my shock and horror, it's the one where one of the where uh, Bordis is addicted to porn. Oops, but <laughs> not one of, not one of my best moves. But I would much rather show them the Orville or Family Guy than I would this movie. This is just you know. If you like grim, if you like the horror aesthetic, this is very successful. But boy, was this made for a niche audience. And I can't get over the fact that it's called Pan's Labyrinth, and I feel like it's a bait-and-switch job. 90% of it takes place in, you know, in the real world. Dealing with the captain and all of his violence. 
or the mom and her slowly but surely dying in her in, in the bed. I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm sure Sean has a wild and woolly defense of this. Most, I mean, again, it won a lot of awards. This is exactly the kind of movie that critics uh, just do cartwheels over. And, and good on them. You know, I certainly can respect a well-made picture and it deserving all the awards that it gets. And this isn't about... You know, as Robert Winfrey likes to joke, you know, like, oh, there weren't any explosions, so I didn't like it. Look, there was a period of time where where the indie flick Osama was one of my favorite movies. You want to talk about subtitles. Subtitles in the, the Afghan language, folks. Go check it out if you can find a copy of Osama. Good flick. So that's certainly not the issue here. The issue is there's niche, then there's this. And if you, you know, and, and as Jim Cornette would say, if this is the kind of thing people like, you know, then you know, that's the kind of thing people like. And that's fine. But I'm not them peoples. Your witness, sir. It bears noting that Guillermo del Toro has never really specifically said whether, whether or not the mythical world in the movie was truly real or just a figment of Ophelia's, ma- of Ophelia's imagination. However, despite the fact that he has said that it's meant to be somewhat ambiguous and that people should try to read into it whatever they want to lend it their own personal substance, he has said that there are definitely hints in the movie that strongly suggest that yeah, it really was all real. And that's a big part of the beauty of it is the fact that well, nobody ever said this was intended for children. In fact, quite the obvious. It's an honest reflection on escapism from a terrible reality and just how far you can ever really entirely get away. It's a search for wonder in a world shredded by shredded by war and the very worst realities of human nature. It can it's beautifully ambiguous, but it contains a wonderful mirror juxtaposition of the mundane with the magical. At one point, Ophelia must voyage into a tree in order to convince convince a toad to stop destroying everything around it. In order to do that, she has to feed it some feed it some magic stones that, so that it will belch up a big puddle of queso containing a necessary magical magical key. Back in the real world, a stolen real key allows real key allows the revolutionaries to infil, infiltrate a secret supply bunker, one which has been main been maintained by the fascists who are also growing fat while pillaging and poisoning everything around them. <clears throat> Later, when Ophelia must infiltrate the feast of the pale man, her greed becomes her greed becomes her ruin. She goes in she goes in with seeming ease, is all set to make good her escape but makes one fatal error and it costs her the lives of two of the of two of her compatriots as the pale man attacks back up in the real world the gorilla assault on assault on the bunker is blundered because using the key means that the captain is quickly able to deduce that deduce that since it wasn't forced that must have meant that someone had the key and from there it's only a matter of time until he exacts his own revenge and takes several key characters' lives with him. That's why everything... That's kind of the beauty of it, is you're never sure if everything that's going on is just Ophelia's way of trying to make sense of everything that's going on around her, all of the utterly senseless, brutal, tragic violence. And if it's perhaps just her coping mechanism. There's even a certain way you could view 
way you could view her ultimate end in that possibly her sacrificing herself rather than having seeing the blood of an innocent shed is her way of possibly dying with a certain degree of peace because after all she certainly hasn't had any throughout the rest of the movie the fact is when I, gen when I generally think of Del Toro the first thing I think of is damn certainly not subtext um, his movies are typically utter feasts for the eyes they are absolute wondrous mesmerizing spectacle um, as much as I love this my favorites are always going to be probably a three way tie between Blade 2 and the first two Hellboy movies for just that very reason he has this way of blurring reality and, fan and fantasy and leaving you equally gripped by both and it's why this story could have only come from his from his utterly beautiful mind. I mean, yeah, I can see where the prosecution is coming from when he talks about not being sure who this movie was made for. It's kind of the Dark Crystal problem, if you will. When that came out, it was never really explicitly clear to whom that was supposed to appeal either, which was probably what made this a bit of a tricky sell in theaters. However, once you do sit down and, watch, sit down and give it a watch, and I admit it probably should not be shown to particularly young children, it's easy to see it as something that you could see and have it stick with you for the rest of you, for the rest of your life. It my one complaint about it would really be that it takes a little bit for sort of the connectedness of everything to come together in, in an easily discernible manner. You know, I have to admit, for a while there, I was watching. I was watching this and thinking to myself, "Well, all well and good, but why aren't we in the labyrinth more often? Why are we spending all this, all this time centered on this one little conflict of the Spanish Civil War?" But when I got it, oh, I got it, and I appreciated it. All in all, it really is a fairly tightly told tale and in my opinion a masterpiece of modern of modern fantasy it's epic it's poetic it's a slow descent into the into the underworld and ultimately in the end when the true nature of the fawn is revealed you realize that no nothing ever really was quite as you expected it to be. I mean, I went into that part of the movie thinking for certain that he was going to be revealed to be some kind of villain, some deceiver, someone who was seeking to perhaps overthrow the underworld gov overworld government and take over the human world. But, no. As it turned out, he was the proctor of some kind of grand exam to determine whether the princess was worthy to, to return to her kingdom. I think it's kind of shameful that in its first three weeks at the box office in the U.S., this movie made only $5.4 million. As of March 1st, 2007, it had made $37, mil 37 million and fortunately rallied another $80 million worldwide to kind of bolster its meager total. In Spain alone, it made almost twelve million, and it currently ranks as the fourth highest domestically grossing foreign, foreign film in the United. In, yeah, that is correct. I had to kind of reread my wording there. Uh, currently, in the in the United States, it ranks as the fourth highest domestic grossing foreign film of all time, and of course, made back another fifty five million from its DVD sales and rentals. So. 
yeah, initially box office flop, but a strong award showing and word of mouth more than did it the justice that it deserved. Yours to finish up. Let me say this. I understand the argument, and I certainly understand the intent of the film, that this is uh, both an both escapism for the audience as it is with Ophelia. You know, Ophelia is in a situation she doesn't want to be in from the very start of the film. She did not want to recognize him as her stepfather. She did not want to go to the castle. You know, all the uh, sort of typical for a child protagonist in these kinds of uh, in these kinds of movies. You know, why 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 do we need stepdad? Uh, I, and I get that. So she so there's this possibility that she is creating this underworld realm, and all of the labyrinth scenes are you know her imagination. Uh, her sort of dealing with the dealing with the trauma of her surroundings. That's fine. So then I have to question her sanity as well because I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just me, and, and maybe I'm not I'm not giving proper credit to the time in which this child uh, is living in, or to the sort of stimuli that she has come across. But I just. I, <sighs> When I think about fantasy and I think about, where, you know, where would I rather be rather than my humdrum life, um, I'm probably not running afoul of a guy, uh, you know, of the pale man or even the fawn. They, they just, I, I keep coming back to this. You know, when Alice falls asleep and she travels to Wonderland, um, the, the, you know, there are parts of Wonderland that are utterly fantastic. I mean, not, not done by... Uh, not in any modern not in any iteration of Alice in Wonderland. Oh gosh, what was the director's name? Um, Tim Burton. Yeah, not 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 in his interpretation of Alice in Wonderland, but you know, normal people. Um, you know, Al- Alice goes to a, to a place of magic, a place of wonder, a place of color, <laughs> a place where there, where outside of the Jabberwocky, there isn't a scary monster. Uh, yeah. I, it's painfully obvious the prosecution has never played either of American McGee's Alice games. <laughs> like I said, normal people. Um, Fucking nightmare. <laughs> normal people. Hot shot at gamers. Bite your tongue. Um, God damn it, Alice in Wonderland's a lovely story. People should stop ruining it uh, by turning it into monsters left and right. Any gate, my, my point being that I feel like most kids, when they, you know, when they want to escape their surroundings, dream up the fantastic, not the monstrous. So it's a little hard for me to sort of, you know, allow the movie to sort of hang its hat on this is where she went to. Okay, okay. My minor counterpoint to that, though. In a way, I can kind of see where it's coming from because if you can take some of the actions of what you're seeing around them, around you, and kind of attribute them to monsters, to otherworldly creatures, it's sort of, I could see how it would sort of help the denial of being forced to accept human beings are actually capable of some of this shit. Let me... let me. I, I, I see your point, and I would concede it except for the fact that, I mean, if, if let's say, for example, um, and maybe this is more hitting you over the head with it, you know, than... Uh, Swing away. Than, than, than the movie should, but if, if Ophelia is standing in front of the captain and, and, and he suddenly morphs into a monster... Because that's what she sees, and that that's how her brain is interpreting what's around her. That's one thing, and I get it, and I'm okay with it. That's not escapism, though. And to, so to say the labyrinth is escapism, so you're escaping to a place that's equally or more horrifying? Again, I go to the pale man scene. It, it's a nice scene. You know, I, I get the, I get the, um, the symbolism... And all of that, as it's attached to what's happening in the real world, I thought that was a, I thought that was a finally made point. Uh, one I wish one I wish I had thought of, and you know, and I give you a lot of credit for it. But again, that's it, you escaped from one situation to another that's equally or more horrifying. Well, I mean, uh, again, though, it's 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 kind of creating a scenario. 
And, and again, this is part of the wondrous ambiguity of this movie, is the fact that you can interpret it a number of ways. See, I'm more, what, willing, I'm more willing to bet this is Guillermo sort of excising his traumas and his, uh, and his issues. Well, see, and I mean, and, and one way you could, de- you could kind of think of it is every day she sees these remorseless, vicious adults around her. Um, armed to the tee, no qualms about spilling the blood of their the blood of their fellow men. She has no way to combat to combat this to stand against it. But on the other hand, you know the other creatures, the pale man, the toad. These are things she can seemingly figure out a way to outwit. Um, if you're, and that's if you're looking at it, sort of that way, and in a strange way, yeah, maybe that does kind of make them just a little bit less scary. I'll concede the point. I just this, I, and we'll end it with the yeah. I, I the the gal asked me today. She's like, "What'd you think of the movie?" and Look, it's a well-made movie. It, this is not one of those on trials where I could, you know, I could go on attacking the craft. Um, no. <laughs> I mean, we, we, you want to you know, if, if there's I, stuff I, that I, if there's stuff I, that I, you you know you had issue with, hang on. If you had stuff that you had issue with and want to bring up now, that's 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 fine. We can, we'll, we'll quick get into like eh, some of this movie. There were there were craft issues, but other than. I just don't feel like you spend enough time in the in the in the in the movie's namesake for truly really make the whole experience worth it. Um, other than that, I mean, you know, the acting, the the set pieces, the um, you know, all, all the things that go into making a movie, I thought were were fine and deser- you know and deserving of the praise that they got. Um, I think where where the movie fell down for me, you know, I think I think the the answer I gave her, and granted, this was sort of a, I don't have an hour to explain my thoughts, you know, was like it was okay, it's not for me. Um, so what uh, what what real quick, what craft issues did you have with the movie? Oh no, I, I'm I'm sorry, I. I kept cutting you off. I apologize for that. I think you misunderstood. I was going to say, if you had any craft issues with it, dude, I could let this go on for another hour, probably, <laughs> arguing anything you would come up with. No, uh, it's, it's a very uh, artfully made movie. Yeah, as with just about everything Del Toro makes, it is absolutely delightful to watch. Carrie is slightly disagreeing with me. <laughs> I mean, it's no... Don't get me wrong. It's no Porky's. But it's fine. <laughs> it's so, it's so <laughs> and I think that's a great place to end the show. What do you think? <laughs> well, fuck me running, Mark. I'm I'm deeply sorry that it doesn't feature giant robots peeing on John Turturro for you. Uh, that's not the best part of Transformers for me. No, the one that I like is Age of Ultron. That's the that's the go to one. Age of Ultron, which. Uh, not Age of Ultron. Shit, not Age of Ultron. Age of Extinction. Jesus, I'm tired. I was, yeah, was going to say that. I briefly win. Wait a fucking tick. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, real talk. All pre-assigned roles for this debate aside, I absolutely loved this. I was glad I stopped and watched it. It's not the kind of popcorn flick that I think I could put on anytime I happen to feel like watching a movie. Uh Carrie is once more indicating to me no way in hell she has any intention of probably ever again watching it all the way through. Um, <laughs> but I, I was glad I sat down and watched it, but now uh, I want to eventually sit down and watch Hellboy and Hellboy 2 The Golden Army. It's funny that because the whole time I'm thinking this, I'm like, I'm a little, I'm a little shy about you know going into my usual rant about things because his girlfriend's going to think what kind of dullard rockhead moron do you do this podcast with? And you now, oh, meanwhile, meanwhile she's over there like fuck, fuck Pan's Labyrinth. All right, now I feel better. Oh, not, <laughs> not in, not in the least. We, 
we we have our movies that we both love, and I'm sure that as time goes on, we're going to come across those that one of us likes, and the other one just goes, yeah, no. Well, we're going to go from the sublime to the absurd next month, as our next on trial will be March 28th, and it'll be Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. Uh, okay, uh, Carrie has volunteered has volunteered to join in to join in on that one. Terrific. Um, <laughs> <coughs> we're doing that because on Monday, Monday of that week, um, Jesse Starcher will be doing Scooby Doo Apocalypse on source material, and in the middle of all that, we'll actually be looking at the Netflix uh, biopic for Motley Crue, The Dirt, based on the. Autobiography written by all four members of Motley Crue. Well, five members if you count the guy that replaced Vince Neil. Uh, the Dirt. And then on uh, that week, the Metal Hammer of Doom will be looking at Motley Crue's greatest hit. So that'll be a lot of fun. I'll be, that'll be the week I come back from my uh, spring break cruise. So it'll be a good week to, to jump in there. As far as what other on trials we're doing, like I said, March 28th is Scooby Doo 2. Um, not, qu- not quite as heavy as Pan's Labyrinth, but right up there. <laughs> um, in April, we're actually going to take a break from uh, On Trial, and we're going to do, as Sean mentioned, his, one, yeah, some of his favorite movies. We're going to do them as a long road to ruin. We're going to bring that back this year. Uh, Hellboy, 2004 uh, and 2008. Uh, I, um, hey, real quick, am I prosecuting or defending Scooby-Doo? Prosecuting. Fuck Yeah. <laughs> I, I I like to take all the hard cases, um, all the nonsense ones. Uh, so yeah, long road to ruin for that. In uh, May, we've got on the May 9th, we've got on trial the Three Musketeers, and a long road to ruin for John Wick, the first two movies. So that's what's next up over the next couple of months. Uh, as for this week, real quick. Uh, we did not do... There was no Metal Hammer of Doom this week. One, I wasn't feeling up to it. Two, the new Bring Me the Horizon was just not our thing, and I didn't feel up to, you know, spending an hour <laughs> trying to explain why... Look, I know I get why some people would like it, but it's not my bag, nor Jesse Starcher's. Plus, I needed to watch Pan's Labyrinth, so um, we decided to axe it from the schedule. However, we do have Voltron Season 8. Robert Winfrey and I got into a great discussion... For an hour discussing the final season of Voltron Legendary Defender on Netflix. And if you want to see two utterly confused comic book readers, check out the podcast for the search for Ray Palmer on source material. Uh, (laughs) As Jesse Starcher and I just throw our hands up in aggravation saying, I don't understand you, DC. Um, Next week, a much easier task uh, on hand as we'll be looking at Punisher Max Volume 5, The Slavers. And we'll be doing a TV party for Punisher Season 2. And on the Metal Hammer of Doom, we'll be re- reviewing the new Beast in Black. All right, Sean, go ahead and do your plugs. Where are you twitching these days? Uh, well, I actually have got a little logistical reconfiguring that I've got to do before I can get back to streaming. Um, just getting moved into the new digs, so I'm still kind of getting used to my usual routine. Um, I've got to figure out my actual streaming setup as far as time and getting a slightly bigger TV goes. Um, I need a chair that I'll be able to sit in for about two or three hours at a time. Uh, I had been using my old exercise ball, but we have a vicious predator kitty in the house that I fear will eviscerate it if I even dare try to inflate it. Um... (laughs) Uh, so that is on momentary hiatus. However, when I come back in the not too distant future, uh, my plan is to get back, get right back to playing a whole lot of competitive Overwatch, preferably with my good buddy and Reaper Extraordinaire Raven. Um, playing a whole lot of Dead by Daylight. Now that I'm actually starting to get my survivor skills back. Um, and getting back to single-player gaming, starting with finishing Batman Arkham Knight and Marvel Spider-Man, 
If you want to keep up on when I am going to be streaming again, which hopefully will be sometime within the next month or two, uh, follow me on Twitter, at Comer Codex. Um, now that I'm poking my head out of my little hidey hole again, uh, <laughs> um, I will you know, be getting back to that soon, because I have missed showing everybody just how much I am capable of sucking at video games in front of an audience. Um, and, yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll even be able to drag some guests along with me. All right, folks. Uh, court is now in recess. Uh, we hope you'll join us again soon. For Sean, I'm your mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radlitz. This has been On Trial, and we look forward to offending you in the future. Have a good night. I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, America's premier home purchase lender. We've created a new way to protect you from unpredictable interest rates. Our exclusive Rate Shield approval. First, we lock your interest rate for up to 90 days. Then, if rates go up, your rate stays locked. But if rates go down, your rate drops. Either way, you win. Call us today at 800 Quicken or go to rocketmortgage.com. Rate Shield approval only valid on certain 30 year fixed rate loans. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. Licensed in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply.